Tonight, we're very fortunate to have with us our speaker from the International Rhino Foundation. He studied at Cornell University, has edited and co-authored field guides and many scientific publications on wildlife conservation. He's a tremendous advocate of, zoo, of zoos like ours who are dedicated to preserving biological diversity. He's helped uh, develop the conservation programs at both Philadelphia and Houston Zoo. And his current work involves developing and funding rhino conservation projects in Africa and Asia. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Bill Comston. You're taller than I am. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Um, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. And uh, you told me you were afraid of public speaking. Uh, that. Uh, and you didn't seem to be at all. Uh, I, I'll give you a tip, the tip that someone gave me, or actually two people gave me a tip long ago because I was definitely afraid of get up, getting in front of an audience like this, even though you're very happy, smiling people. Uh, I asked someone, what, you know, how, do you, how do you prepare for that? And one friend said, oh, I go jogging, I run. I'll run for 20, 30 minutes, maybe even an hour. I said, that sounds good. The other one said, uh, I have a drink. I, you know, have a glass of wine. I said, okay. I couldn't make up my mind who was right, so I spent an hour running from one bar to the next. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Um, so, anyway, it is my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, and I do, I also would add um, my uh, sincere appreciation for volunteers. My dad was a volunteer policeman, if you will, in New York State. He, spent 35 years doing that um, and he was awarded a presidential he was given a presidential award for it unfortunately it was after he died so my mom accepted it for him he probably wouldn't have accepted it anyway because it was from uh, George Bush and he didn't like George Bush <laughs> but no seriously uh, you uh, those of you who volunteer volunteer is not a job description um, it's a rate of pay and it's uh, it's what people do because they really believe in something and uh, I would I, I would thank you for all you do for the Blank Park Zoo and, and the, I understand the conservation program here owes you a, a debt of gratitude. So, why don't we start? My uh, title, the title of my presentation is The World's Rarest Rhinos uh, and I would like to basically show you uh, that at one time or another uh, each one of the five species of rhinos could uh, fit that uh, distinction. And I, uh, you, these rhinos, if you haven't seen them, I had the chance to meet them today, the two uh, youngsters, and they are absolutely incredible. Uh, they're going to be a, a great attraction. Uh, you, I don't think, I, I also feel honored and flattered that I was given the opportunity for a behind the scenes tour to, to, pet, rhino, uh, to pet a rhino, and um, it's an experience that I hope all of you at some, one time or another get a chance uh, to experience. I also want to, um, just mention the fact that Blank Park Zoo, uh, even though it's a relatively small zoo uh, in this country, is one of distinction because it will be hosting the Zoos and Aquariums Committing to Conservation uh, Conference this July, and uh, that's an, it's an incredible conference. If you have a chance to attend that, I, I certainly uh, suggest that you do. You meet people from around the world who are doing um, incredible things for many different types of species. What I'm going to try and do tonight is talk about a subject that's uh, pretty dire. Uh, action is urgent and the situation is, is critical, but if you look at the glass, you know, if you're looking at it and you think in terms of rhino conservation that it's ha half empty, I'm going to try and convince you that it's actually half full. And uh, you'll let me know at the end if I've actually succeeded in doing that. <laughs> But let's look at rhinos. Okay, we're gonna do a little evolution. Uh, first, rhinos or rhino-like creatures first appeared on the earth about 50 million years ago. Uh, they didn't have horns. Uh, if rhinos didn't have horns today, they probably wouldn't be in very much trouble. These first rhinos weren't really recognizable as such, I would say. They were small by comparison to modern day species, maybe the size of a Great Dane or a little bit larger and they had long legs, and they were known as the running rhinos, at least that's what the paleontologists refer to them as. Then about 30 million years ago, um, there was an incredible radiation of, of rhino-like species. Again, they still, many of them still didn't have horns, but they shared other characteristics. Some were of incredible size. 
this species that came uh, from the uh, middle of uh, the Eurasian continent um, was about the size of a double-decker bus. It was probably the largest living, a uh, largest land mammal ever to live on the planet. Uh, its name was Belucotherium, and I think there's an album by that name, and why they chose that for the name of their album, I'll never know. Then about two million years ago, we're moving rapidly here, about the time that my mother-in-law's family, uh, <laughs> about that time, uh, uh, first appeared, we then had a, um, we had a, a, a relationship with rhinos. Before that, rhinos existed without human companionship. And I found this, and we, and we know this now but based on cave art such as this in, in France, and I found this interesting cover on the um, February 20, 1922 issue of Scientific American, which clearly shows that the extinct woolly rhino and Neanderthals uh, had a very, very intense relationship. And if you look closely, what you, uh, and if you're intuitive, you can see here that Neanderthals and woolly rhinos invented baseball. <laughs> right? It's clear as day, to me anyway. Okay, we'll fast forward again. About the time of Christ, there was a, um, a naturalist in Rome called Pliny the Elder. And he wrote about all species, uh, uh, tomes. He wrote you know, on and on and on about all these creatures, uh, including rhinos. And he decided that rhinos and elephants were mortal enemies. Uh, should mention that he never saw a rhino in his life, but that didn't stop him from uh, perpetuating this myth. And that, the point that there are myths about creatures such as rhinos is very in, important because that has set the stage for much of what has followed in the history for that, of that species. Round about, uh, just prior to the Renaissance, uh, Marco Polo made uh, a series of voyages and travels around the world, which are well known, and he wrote about the creatures that he, uh, that he met uh, during, those, uh, during those expeditions. And he visited the island of Sumatra, and he talked about what he called the monoceros, mono being one, seros being horn, the one-horned creature, a very shaggy creature. And on the island of Sumatra, at one time existed two rhino species, the Javan and the Sumatran. One of them had one horn, the other had two. One of them was hairy, the other was not. So he probably saw both and decided that they were the same species and combined them. That's not of great importance, but what he also did at the time was he made some statements about the relationship of the rhino to the unicorn because it was believed, and it's debatable whether he was saying that it was true or not based upon the translation of his, of his writings, it was believed at that time that this mythical beast, the unicorn, had a, an appendage, this horn, that had magical properties. So then uh, the rhino, was it, if it was thought to be the unicorn or related to the unicorn, must possess those same qualities. This, was a, this is a curse that started, you know, a thousand years ago or so that has uh, dogged this creature or dogged these creatures uh, for that amount of time. Now, the, this illustration is probably the uh, best known, uh, most widespread image of a rhino that exists on the planet today. It was done in 1515 by a German artist. His name was Albrecht Durer. Uh, and just like Pliny the Elder, he had never seen a living rhinoceros, but that didn't stop him. He uh, got a, a sketching from a friend and said, oh, this is what they look like. Now, this was the Indian rhinoceros that he was depicting. It was based on an animal that was captured in India shipped from, in, uh, given by the ruler of that province at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, to the emperor or king of Portugal, I'm not quite sure who, he, you know, what his title was, who didn't really want it and then re-gifted it to the pope. So he <laughs> sent it to Rome on a ship, but unfortunately the ship never got there, uh, sank, the rhino drowned, they dredged it up, they stuffed it and gave it to the pope anyway. <laughs> 
you'll notice that the skin of this animal is, it looks like armor. In fact, it almost has rivets in it, which it, when you look at a, an Indian rhino today, it does have folds of skin like that. And, and this is a one-horned animal, except for the fact that it's also got a horn at the back of its neck, which it's probably the, you know, that's the only total inaccuracy in the, in the illustration. But this is what the world, this is how the world knew rhinos during uh, essentially the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. This is the most famous rhino that has ever lived. Her name was Clara. She too is an Indian rhino, was an Indian rhino. She was born in Assam, Northeast India. She was captured as a young animal. She was raised in the house of the governor of that state. Uh, she ate from a bowl like a dog, you know, like the family dog, and she was bought by a Dutch sea captain who then took her to, um, to Europe. He, um, they rounded the Cape of, of Africa, and it took months and months and months for that voyage, during which she drank beer and ate tobacco, among other things. Uh, evidently, that was good for her because she spent the next 17 years touring Europe, meeting um, and being paraded in front of heads of state, uh, royalty of all sorts. There are, pro there are more images of this, of this rhino than there have ever been of any living uh, rhino uh, uh, in terms of prints, art prints, ceramics, every kind of you know, tchotchke you could, you could think of. And um, again, this is how the world knew rhinos for a thousand years, this, basically this one-horned Indian rhino. In the uh, last century, one of our former presidents, um, and this defines a period in, in rhino history that's not been good for, too good for them, this, this uh, period of trophy hunting, President uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who was actually one of the world's greatest wildlife conservationists after his presidency, went to Africa to collect specimens of multiple species for uh, museum exhibits. And that was, you know, that was for scientific purposes, and you can argue whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but it did obviously result in the death of, of individuals. Um, Roosevelt was, a, was criticized for that by somebody he'd hired. He'd hired this man who's known, popularly known as Buffalo Jones. He was the first superintendent of Yellowstone National Park. He was a real cowboy. He raised uh, bison and some of the bison that were reintroduced uh, in this country to uh, save that species. He was upset that Roosevelt went to Africa and shot uh, rhinos and lions and, and uh, hippos and whatever he was shooting. And Buffalo Jones got a g bunch of his cowboy pals together and said, we're going to go over there and we're going to show, we're going to lasso everything that you just shot to show the world that you don't have to shoot these animals. If you need them for, for zoos or whatever, then you go over and you lasso them. And he went and he did it. And he wrote a book. I, I highly recommend it. It's called The Lord of Beasts. And he did what he said he was going to do. And Roosevelt wrote him a letter of apology saying, yeah, you're right. You bested me. You showed me that I didn't have to do what I did. Um, so that defined uh, our relation, oh, those things have helped define our relationship with rhinos through the years. Now we're here at the present day, and this map shows the five rhino species that exist and their approximate numbers, because nobody really, for some of them, we don't really know. Actually, only for two of them do, are we really certain what the numbers are. There's the white rhino that the, uh, will go from the bottom left and clockwise around, the white rhino of southern Africa. If you can't read it, it says it's near threatened. There are more than 20,000 of them left in, the, left in the wild. There are approximately 500 or more in zoos around the world. And that's the most numerous rhino species on the planet right now, 20,000 plus. Then you've got the black rhino, which is the species they have here that you have at Blank Park Zoo, which numbers about, five, actually it's a little over 5,000. There are maybe 200 or so in captivity and it is a critically endangered species, which means within the matter of only a few generations, it could go extinct if, uh, if conditions don't change. Then you have the Indian rhino in, um, in northeastern India, approximately 3,300 left in the wild and a couple hundred maybe in captivity. It's, called, it's vulnerable, which is somewhere between near threatened and critically endangered. Don't let the terms throw you. The two rhinos in Africa have two horns. The Indian rhino has one horn. Um, it uh, will explain later why it's only vulnerable and not uh, critically endangered. Then you've got the two Asian, uh, Southeast Asian rhinos, the Javan rhino and the Sumatran rhino. And as you can see by their numbers, it's like 
maybe 100 and less than 50. One of them, there's only 10 in zoos, and the other, there's absolutely none in captivity. I mean, they essentially define, define the term critically endangered. Um, a natural disaster in one of those species could be gone, as you'll see later. So five rhinos, less than 30,000 on the planet. If you took every one of them and gave them a seat at the Jack Trice, uh, the Jack Trice Stadium, half the stadium would be empty. Every rhino in the world wouldn't, well, I guess the seats would have to be bigger, but. <laughs> and if you took the job in rhino at less than 50 and you put them nose to tail, they might just make it from one goalpost to the other. That would be all of them left in the world. They might just make it, right? But they wouldn't go there anyway because we just learned they're baseball fans. They're not football fans. <laughs> okay, so that's the state of rhinos today. These are record horns of rhinos. As you can see, the African, the two on the left are the African <coughs> species. They, uh, they will, some of them have grown horns uh, that are four feet long or more. The Asian rhino horns tend to be shorter. Doesn't matter. Uh, on today's black market, each and every one of those horns is worth more than $100,000. Rhino horn is worth its weight in gold. It sells for uh, uh, prices greater than the cost of drugs like heroin. Um, and this is something that has actually been true of species other than rhinos. And in this country, back in the early 1900s, can you tell me what animal item sold for its weight in gold? Anybody have any idea? Snow feathers, bird feathers for, I'm nothing against you ladies, but for women's hats. Bird feathers were selling for their weight in gold. Okay, so we can't point fingers. We've done the same thing here, not with rhinos, but with other species. Okay, why would anybody pay that kind of money for rhino horn. Myth and superstition for centuries because they thought that rhino horn was, had the magical properties of unicorn horns. And, and this is largely an Asian phenomenon, but not entirely so. Well, actually, some people have said that, they, that the horn was an aphrodisiac, but that a lot of people discredit that claim. But certainly, in a traditional Asian medicine, Rhino horn was prescribed for fever, uh, to reduce fevers. It, now I'm going to go through a list of them here. Now all of these, there's no evidence. Remember, there's no evidence that it does any of these things. But this is what is has been said and resaid, told and retold, and that makes it gospel. Rhino horn could help cure food poisoning, detect poisonings. In the ancient days, evidently, people tried to poison one another uh, in drinks. And so if you had a chalice or a cup that was made of rhino horn and someone poured you a drink and it was poison, it would effervesce sort of like Alka-Seltzer and you would know it that, you were, that somebody was trying to kill you. Um, it, rhino horn in powdered form or potion or tonic or whatever could cure scorpion bites or mad dog bites. <laughs> evidently, that was a big problem. Um, Fainting spells, you could take rhino horn for fainting. Or if you had worms. Or epilepsy, I mean some serious diseases here now. Or memory loss, like I have. <laughs> or diphtheria, some serious diseases. There was even in the literature the claim that rhino horn could cure the plague. So if it could do all the, I mean this is the wonder drug, obviously. So why wouldn't you pay any amount of money to get a hold of this drug to cure any of these ailments? That's what, that's the curse of the unicorn that the rhinos have had to bear, you know, since we, uh, not since we came upon the planet, but since man decided. In Asia, we, we see this now, major markets being China, Vietnam, but back in the 1600s, 1700s in Europe, the European, uh, the London Pharmaceutical Society, or whatever it was called at that point, had as its emblem. Now these are doctors; these are these are physicians. They had an, the rhino in their emblem. They too believed it. So this is not just an Asian phenomenon. Okay, well, now we've seen our relationship with rhinos. Let's take a look at each one of the species uh, and and examine it in more detail. The white rhino, basically a Southern African species. If you can't make out the the 
words down there. Basically, the green areas in Africa were its, its prior range, its former range. That, that little ellipse at the top there in the middle is gone. No more of those animals left in the wild. So basically, a southern Af African species. In 1900, I, I told you before, there are now 20,000 or more of these left. In 1900, how many do you think there were? Around and about. Anybody have an idea? Any, hmm? Over 100,000, she says. Anybody want to venture another guess? Try about 100 animals. 100. 100. Zero, zero. The species had been wiped out almost entirely. It existed in only one game reserve down, and if, again, uh, if you can't read it, it doesn't matter. There's a little rhino in the southern part of Africa, South Africa, in what's called the Umphalozi Game Reserve. Only about 100 animals, if that, were believed to remain in the wild. So conservation measures were put in place. The breeding was uh, undertaken. Uh, protection was undertaken. Breeding occurred. Animals were then translocated. All those black dots represent areas to which the rhinos were translocated, reintroduced to former habitat or to areas that they didn't exist before. That, over the course of a century, has brought the species to over 20,000 in the wild. One of the world's greatest conservation success stories. Or comebacks. I mean. Is it a success if it's less than the species was before it started? I don't know. Certainly one of the world's greatest conservation comebacks. I'll, I'll, I'll take questions after, is that, if that's all right. Um, also, from that one population, animals were sent to zoos around the world. So almost all of the white rhinos that are in zoos today came from that 100, uh, originated from that founder population of 100. Unfortunately, today, the white rhino, uh, and I won't show you much doom and gloom here, but this, it's important to understand what happens. Rhino horn, in order, uh, when poachers take a rhino's horn, they take its life, and it's not pretty. And this, the, the rhinos that are being killed today are largely white rhinos from uh, the Republic of South Africa. In fact, last year, there were almost 700 of them taken. Uh, the year before that, it was almost 500. This year, it's on track to even to exceed the 700. That represents a rhino every, what, 13.4 hours. You might, might as well say every 12 hours or two rhinos every day are being killed in South Africa. That is unsustainable over the long term. Interestingly enough, the rhinos are, the number of white rhinos is still increasing due to natural breeding despite this poaching rate. Again, over the short term, sustain uh, over the short term they handled over the long term it will not um, they will not survive but remember that two animals per day so what are we doing what does the international rhino foundation do we uh, focus most of our efforts on protection efforts uh, on protect on supporting the protection programs we will uh, supply train uh, equip Rangers, rhino rangers, these are the people who are on the front line. They're the ones who are dealing with some very sophisticated poachers, uh, mechanized, uh, mobilized, uh, highly, um, uh, well, very well integrated poachers who are tied to uh, traffickers, who are tied to the crime syndicates in foreign countries that are taking the rhino horn from South Africa and shipping it to other countries. Now. Protection is one uh, thing that needs to be dealt with. The other thing that has to be um, considered is the prosecution. If someone is captured, is a suspect, they need arrests have to be made, sentences have to be uh, given out. So lawyers and judges have to understand the uh, importance, the severity of these crimes. Then there are the people who are taking the, the horn across uh, international borders and the people on the consumer end. All those have to be taken into consideration. In, in our world today, it's a lot different than it was 100 years ago. These channels are like pipelines, and, and uh, when things happen, they happen fast and, and in large order. There's an organization known as Traffic that, uh, that um, monitors this trade. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a bulletin here that says the South African Vietnam Rhino Horn Trade Nexus. Okay, Ma major consumer today of rhino horn from South Africa is, is the country of Vietnam. There's a lot of disposable income 
and the Vietnamese, it's a status symbol. The, um, it's almost a party drug, if you will. Uh, it, they now believe that rhino horn cures hangovers. The president of Vietnam came out and said that he had cancer and that his cancer was cured by rhino horn. Okay. Um, that's very unfortunate because if people believe that and they're buying rhino horn at this highly inflated price and not getting the proper treatment, people are dying because they believe uh, you know, claims that are just erroneous. So what's being done there and the demand side, that's important. Uh, you might recognize Yao Ming, a uh, former NBA star who um, is now working with an organization called Wild Aid. Here he's at the Houston Zoo with uh, the director, Rick Barangi, who's on the board of directors of the International Rhino Foundation, posing with a white rhino. His campaigns are focused on uh, what happens to rhinos because their horns are taken, what happens to elephants because their tusks are taken, and he's working in China preferentially. But you have similar organizations working in Vietnam. And these efforts will change public attitudes. They will uh, certainly reduce ignorance. And in some of the, if you check out a website for an organization called Education for Nature Vietnam, you'll see some of the work that's being done right now. And it's pretty bold in your face to the Vietnamese people saying, if you didn't know that rhinos are dying for their horn, you know it now. And if you did know it and you're still purchasing it, then you're evil. You are not, uh, you are a monster. You are, it's pretty nasty, but it's what's gonna, need, it's what's needed in order to change attitudes, I think. And it won't happen quickly. It may get worse before it gets better, but it is part of the solution. Okay, the black rhino. This is a species we, that you now have here at Blank Park. Um, it, you can see its range uh, was much broader than that of the white rhino, more into northern and uh, still sub-Saharan Africa, but west across to the Atlantic coast. Unfortunately, all those northern and western populations are, are no longer, and it's basically a, a southeastern species. There are, as I said, about 25, uh, there are about 5,000 left. Now, how many of those do you think of this species was uh, were present at the turn of the 20th century, around the year 1900. Remember, there were only about 100 white rhino. Somebody said it before, about 100,000. So at the, at the time of, uh, at, at the same time, you had one species at 100, another at about 100,000, okay? But by the late 1900s, the species re was reduced to 2,500 animals. More than 95% of the species, or 90-something percent, was eradicated throughout its range. It's come back from that to about 5,000, so it has, in fact, doubled in the last 20 years, which is important, but it's nowhere near where it should be, which is why it's still considered critically endangered. And if that shocks you, you have to consider that, boy, we went through the same thing here in this country on a larger scale with the bison. Bison numbered 30 to 40 million in the 1800s or late 1700s and were reduced to only a few hundred animals. This was the science, this, these are bison skulls at a train station outside Kansas City. So again, we can point fingers but that doesn't do any good. We've, we've, we've done the same thing. These species have suffered, slaughter has taken place but they have re rebounded. Now there are you know, hundreds of thousands of bison back in the country. Again, not a conservation success story, but certainly a conservation comeback. The International Rhino Foundation works in the country of Zimbabwe. You have to figure out where to work. We all know what the problems are. We kind of know what the solutions are. Then you have to figure out where are you gonna do your work to, to uh, affect the greatest um, change. Our program officer there, our program director is Raul Detroit. He runs an organization called the Lovell Rhino Trust in the, in the Lovell region of Zimbabwe, and he is a Goldman Environmental Prize winner. He's also featured in this new book called Wildlife Heroes, 40 of the top uh, wildlife um, conservationists, including John Lucas, who spoke, uh, spoke here at Blank Park Zoo in, earlier in this series. Raul relies on some pretty basic mythology, uh, metho methodology, I'm sorry, and um, 
some dedicated people who don't make a whole lot of money. These are trackers. These are not the uh, people out there with guns. These are the people who go out there and keep track of the rhinos. And the key to his program and the, and the work we support is that you must know the animals individually. You must be able to identify each individual. If you don't know what you've got, you don't know if you've lost it. And so they spend a lot of time tracking rhinos that are then tagged with uh, numbers, their ears are notched, there's so, so many different ways to, to mark a rhino and if you want to track them you can do so, something like drilling into their horn and in, in plate, uh, implanting a trade, uh, radio transmitter and uh, thus be able to track them because his team is working in an area over 1.5 million acres and there are several hundred rhinos there and the area could actually hold maybe double what it has right now and has, in fact, um, the population has been increasing despite poaching, and you see here the effects of poaching. This rhino actually lived. Uh, veterinary treatment brought uh, this animal back. Sometimes it's necessary to dehorn the animals. You take the horn off and that acts as a deterrent to poaching, sometimes. Uh, in many cases, and, and you know, rhinos without their horns, there's debate as to whether they actually act like normal rhinos. Also, if you're a poacher and you're out there in the brush and it's thick and you can't see the rhino with it and it doesn't have a horn, you shoot first and then find out that it didn't have a horn, so it doesn't deter it. Also, if you've been tracking the animal for two days and you see that it doesn't have a horn, you shoot it anyway because you're really pissed off. Sometimes it's, you can't protect them in a certain area, so you have to take them and you move them to another. So again, if you're dealing with a million and a half acres, you can take them from one part and, and, and move them to another, but it's very expensive to transport um, uh, this is, the lar is a large part of the budget, especially when you need helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft in addition to uh, vehicles that cart around these crates. Sometimes mom doesn't make it, but baby does, uh, and calves can be orphaned. And Sometimes they are too big to bring into captivity. They can make it on their own, so their wounds, because they're often shot too, they're treated and released and, and monitored in the wild. Sometimes they're brought into captivity, they're rescued, they're rehabilitated, and ultimately released to the wild because uh, this is not a, that's not a captive-based program. In Botswana, we're doing the same sort of thing. Um, in Botswana, the black rhino was totally eliminated years ago. We're now looking at taking animals from South Africa where you understand that they're being lost uh, at an incredible rate and moving them across the border to areas that are uh, tourist uh, areas where they, uh, the protection can be increased and where that's the commodity that we think is, is most appropriate for these animals, not for their horn, in a shop, in a potion, in a tonic, but on the range fully, you know, with their horns in full where people can go and see them. Indian rhino once existed along the foothills of the Himalayas, um, has been extirpated, which means eliminated. We don't say ex it's not extinct in a certain area. It's either extinct or it's not extinct. So it's been eliminated from most of its range, just a few populations in uh, Northeast India and Nepal. This is the animal that now numbers about 3,300. At the turn of the 20th century, it was also like the white rhino, down to a population of about 100. So it's come back. Not as much as the white rhino, but it's come back. Um, of the 3,300, most of them are in Kazaranga National Park, over 2,000, so two-thirds of the population in one protected area. And they're breeding very well. Rhinos, you know, they, they can do well. They can, you know, uh, test the carrying capacity of their habitat. In fact, that, in fact, that's what they're doing in Kazaranga, which provides an opportunity. You know, in crisis, there is opportunity. So there's a program called the Indian Rhino Vision 2020, which is taking animals from areas where they are maybe exceeding the carrying capacity, overflowing, if you will, and moving them to areas where they once existed, had been eliminated because protection was poor, instituting new protection programs and repopulating those areas. The goal of this program is to reach 3,000 rhinos in the state of Assam by the year 2020. That state has about 2,500 right now, so 500 rhinos in the next five or six years uh, it can be done and at a reasonable rate of increase if protection efforts hold. It's a pr pretty basic program. This isn't rocket science. Animals are tranquilized. In, uh, so in Kazaranga, the team will go in early in the morning and dart maybe four animals, crate them up, get them prepared, but that takes them most of the day, and then overnight, 
transport them maybe 100, 200 kilometers to their new home in Manas National Park, which was a former World Heritage Site, used to have rhinos, but they were eliminated in the 1990s. Now better protection efforts are in place, so the animals are taken there and they are released. Um, the interesting thing about them is they come running out of the crates. Uh, they have radio collars on now because you want to monitor their progress, and they run, and they go, and they bite the tires of the trucks, and then they run away. They don't use their, they don't use their horns, um, and this is a, this is just one of those things about Indian rhinos. They're, they're actually their, their major defense, their or, or, or their offense, their weaponry is is these lower incisors that are, and when you put the driving force of a you know a two-ton animal behind that, um, you don't want to be on the receiving end. But they, um, the program began in 2008. It's a collaboration between the International uh, Rhino Foundation, World Wildlife Fund, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the state of Assam. In 2012, the first birth occurred in the park. About, uh, there have been about 20-something animals that have been translocated to date. So the first birth in 2012, two more have followed. Two of those, the females, were pregnant probably before they were moved. One of them, she was um, mated uh, or bred while in the park, and that's good news. Bad news is we've had four poaching incidents uh, in that same period of time. So it's basically evened out, and we've actually suspended operations for a while until we can get that under control. Uh, and, and unfortunately, one of the animals that was poached was the mother of the last uh, baby that was born. Baby was lost for a period of time, but then uh, found and rescued and brought into captivity. So we've sort of sequestered those animals, or, or attempting to do so right now, in, in order to deal with a problem. You know, none of this is problem-free, as you can imagine. Um, but again, the the track is uh, is upward. The numbers are increasing. The Sumatran rhino is uh, sometimes called the hairy rhino. It's more closely related. It's got two horns, but it's not related to either of the African species. It's more closely re related to the woolly rhinoceros, the extinct species we showed you uh, earlier. And again, it's the smallest of the animal. Its range was from uh, India all the way south through uh, a Southeast Asia on the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. That's at roughly equivalent to the longitudinal distance across our country from you know east coast to west coast. It now is only found in essentially three places on the island of Sumatra and one place on the island of Borneo. Uh, that map's somewhat old, but again, dots on a map, and maybe 100, maybe more. Uh, we don't know. These are tropical rainforest animals. They're very, very uh, elusive. They're nocturnal. They're hard to find. People don't see them. It's not like going to Kenya on safari and seeing them in the open plains. These are the people who protect them. Um, rhino protection units are employed by International Rhino Foundation in three Indonesian parks. Two of them protect Sumatran rhinos. These are people who get a whole heck of a lot, but they're dedicated. They travel to work about 100 kilometers, usually on a motorcycle. They spend 15 to 20 days in the field. They cover a distance of about 50, each one each year, hikes about 1,500 miles. That's sort of walking from Maine to Florida. And they uh, are armed, obviously, they need to be. They look for things such as snares, pit ball traps. And their efforts help to protect a number of different species. in addition to um, rhinos, uh, Sumatran tigers, Sumatran elephants, Malayan tapirs, all either endangered or critically endangered. Now, I don't know if you know much about the Sumatran rhinos that were born here in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United States at a zoo not all that far from here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Back in 2001, I'm gonna <clears throat> losing my voice here. Where's that glass of wine I needed? Just... <laughs> Back in 2001, um, a female rhino by the name of Emmy gave birth to the first Sumatran rhino <clears throat> born in captivity in over 100 years at the Cincinnati Zoo. Her um, 
caretaker there is actually the zoo's veterinarian, Dr. Terry Roth, who's on the board of directors of the International Rhino Foundation. And it took six pregnancies for Emmy to give birth. First five were miscarriages. The sixth one, uh, Dr. Roth implemented a hormone supplement and produced this young calf. His name uh, is Andalus. And um, he grew up in Cincinnati. He went eventually to the Los Angeles Zoo. And then he was sent, as part of an international breeding program, back to Indonesia, where he found true love. <laughs> Um, the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary is located in Wake Combus National Park, which is one of the areas that the Rhino Protection Unit uh, uh, patrol. He mated with a female that was a wild animal that sort of wandered out of the forest one day. Um, and he mated with her several times, and the first two pregnancies ended in miscarriages, just like had happened to his mother. Uh, and then Dr. Roth, working with Indonesian veterinarians, said, let's try the same thing we tried in, uh, back in uh, Cincinnati, and, and that did work. So on June 23rd, 2012, uh, Andatu, uh, Andalus and, and, and Ratu gave birth to Andatu, uh, this little guy here, whose name in Indonesian translates uh, as gift of God. Um, he was born um, in the middle of the night at a, and weighed in about 60 pounds. And here's a little bit of rhino trivia. What else weighs 60 pounds or weighed 60 pounds? Boris Karloff's makeup and costume. That's Frankenstein. <laughs> Remember that. It's a totally useless fact. OK. Andatu was an instant media star. He um, uh, has his own Facebook page. He has close to. 1,500 friends. I think that's pretty good, because I don't have any. <laughs> and you can be his friend. You can learn a lot about rhinos if you, if, you, if you friend him. He talks a lot for a little guy who's only nine months old and 700 pounds. Uh, but he, um, he was born at a time when the Indonesian president declared the International Year of the Rhino, which is a serious fact, that realizing that the two species that are native to that country are the two most critically endangered mammals on the face of the planet. The other one is the Javan Rhino, uh, which as you can see, its range is very much that uh, the same as the, as the Sumatran, again, uh, equivalent to ranging from one end of the country to the other. Uh, here in the United States, but it only now exists in one national park, less than 50 animals in one national park. It would be as if there were rhinos here in the United States that existed from San Francisco all the way through here to New York, but now we're only left in Central Park. That's, it's, it's insane when you think about it. Um, it's home now is this little peninsula to the west of which lies the dormant volcano of Krakatoa, and people, uh, not that you remember it, but you know the story. Back in the 1880s, late 1880s, it exploded and created the largest, you know, the greatest sound ever heard on the planet, they, they suggest. Sent a tidal wave that was more than 100 feet high across this island, wiped out the entire, not the island, but the, the peninsula, wiped out the entire human population, probably wiped out the rhinos and the tigers that were there as well. But because they existed on uh, to the east, they came back and recolonized the island. And now, but now the only place in the world they exist is this area. So, and, and Krakatoa has a replacement and is growing at several feet per year. So they could be in harm's way again. Charles Lindbergh brought this species to the attention of the world back in the late 60s, early 70s. He flew to Indonesia, found out about the rhino, tried to find it and couldn't, wrote to the editors of Life magazine and said, you got to get somebody over there. This is a real story. This is news. There's an animal that could go extinct. He thought there were only maybe 20 left. And they sent somebody, a, a writer, photographer, who spent three months on the island looking for these animals to write about them. Never found one. Found all kinds of signs. Um, and in fact, some of the Rhino Protection Unit members have been there for years, and they've never seen it in the wild. Uh, I, when I joined the uh, International Rhino Foundation, said, I want a photograph of that animal. I want to see it in the wild. So I went last year and spent about 10 days hiking across the peninsula looking for it. Now, these are guys who know what they're doing. Uh, it didn't bother me that in the whole year of 2011, they never saw a single one. Because when we went out looking for it, we, uh, well, we found something, uh, another large animal. This is, these are uh, actually critically endangered uh, 
cattle, wild cattle called bantang, but we, uh, and this is the, actually the only one I found, uh, <laughs> uh, the elusive badak jawa. Badak means rhino, jawa is um, java, so the elusive javan rhino, there's this wonderful statue out there that makes you think you're going to see one, but don't count on it. You will see footprints. We saw plenty of them. We crossed, uh, we saw some that were very large and probably males. We saw uh, two sets large and small, uh, females with their calves. We came upon evidence of feeding. If a Javan rhino sees something at the top of a tree, well, the tree comes down uh, very, very easily. This, you know, these animals are between one and two tons. We saw wallows where they take their daily, uh, their daily mud baths, okay? And we then, when they leave their mud baths, they create trails. They rub against the trees, and we, we'd see the mud on the, on the saplings and the twigs, and you feel it, and it's wet, and you say, oh my goodness, it must be somewhere near here. I can't hear it, but it's here. I know it's close. We found dung, we, and it was, it was steaming, and it, they were so close, well, you could almost taste it. No, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't do that. <laughs> My wife thinks that's the most disgusting slide, though. Okay. We didn't see them. We never found one. They're there. We figure that we probably caught cross paths with uh, maybe a quarter to a third of the, of the remaining world population without ever seeing one. The, the term hiding in plain sight became clear to me on that expedition. But there is a video of, that was done, video camera tracking, uh, where these cameras were placed near the wallows, right? Uh, over the course of a year, video footage of 35 individually identifiable animals has been obtained, including four calves, uh, which is an incredible statistic when you, when, because normally these camera traps only capture a very small portion of the remaining population. But we can say with certainty that that number has existed. So less than 50 animals for over 50 years in this one spot. It's in. It, it, that, to me, is mind-boggling that they're still there. What we're doing is we're working in an area called Gunung Honje. Uh, Gunung means mountain in uh, the Indonesian la language, and Honje means ginger, so this is Ginger Mountain. And the rhinos don't live up there, but they live in the forest. They like the lowlands around it. The problem with lowland forest is it's going real fast, as you can see right here. You've got um, rice paddies, and it's a highly uh, dense human population. The island of Java is one of the most highly densely uh, populated areas on the planet. So the rhinos could be in those forests. Unfortunately, a lot of those forests are covered by a palm. It's an, an invasive species, an invasive plant. It's called a Renga palm, and it crowds out everything else, and it doesn't provide food for the rhinos. It really doesn't provide food for other species, and it's sort of taking over. So what we're focusing on there for the, this population of, you know, 35 plus animals is to create more habitat. You clear the palm. How do you do it? Uh, you you bring people in, local people. You give them a job, you know, machetes and hack them down and clear it. You create jobs for people. You get them to buy into the um, to the survival of, of a native species, part of their natural heritage. The species happens to be the symbol for their province, so they do. They're they're inclined to want to protect it. And in fact, there's not been any poaching of the job and rhino uh, for the last. 14 years or something close to that, which is an incredible statistic. Think about that, because I told you that close to 700 uh, white and black rhinos were killed in, in uh, South Africa last year, two per day. If that same rate applied to the Javan rhino, they wouldn't last until Memorial Day. Fortunately, the people are not poaching them, but they need more habitat, they, they, and you can't have all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. So the palms are taken away. What happens is, is really incredible, the regrowth. Nature you know, heals itself. So you're getting these plants <clears throat> that uh, some of the palm regrows and, and, and has to be monitored and, and kept in check. But most of the plants, I guess, have been suppressed by the palm, but the seeds are in the soil. So once you remove the palm, all these other species come up. And 11 out of 12 of the species they note are all rhino food plants. So we're starting this program of habitat restoration to increase the area in which this species lives, which is really its only chance for survival. That's, you know, not much else is gonna work right now. You can, in, in some cases, you almost have to put a fence around what you're gonna protect and put the boots on the ground and uh, do the scientific studies and just hope that, you know, the, the poaching threat doesn't just swamp your efforts. 
Well, if you're tired of me <laughs> speaking right now, and I've been going on for a while, uh, what I would suggest you do, if you want to learn more about rhinos and their conservation, is you can go to our website. Uh, it's a very easy one, www.rhinos.org. You can learn, uh, you can adopt a rhino if you want. You can uh, contribute to the Stop Poaching Now campaign. You can watch a video of Jack Hanna, who endorses our work. Um, you can do quite a bit and learn more and interact with us. What I would like to emphasize is that, again, and I think it was said before, just by coming here and visiting your zoo, you are helping, you're supporting rhino conservation through the Quarters for Conservation program and through the other conservation efforts of the zoo. And that's very, very important. Uh, and if that's something that can be done by people across this country at all the zoos in this country, the other partner institutions. So on that, I would like to thank you very much. My dog Blue also thanks you. I can't be, he can't be with me tonight, but he's with me in spirit. So thank you very much. Evidently, evidently, the female in the wild, right, she never been, had never been in captivity. The one in Cincinnati was also a wild-caught female who'd been in captivity for, for some time. And there's not much known about the animal's biology in the wild, especially its reproductive biology, because remember, they're, they're very elusive animals, um, secretive. So I don't know that there's any data uh, that uh, suggests that this is a problem that is common in wild animals. It is a problem. Um, the hormone therapy was based on uh, that that's done in horses, which are close relatives of the rhino. So evidently, it's not uh, something that's very unusual. Um, and Dr. Roth had had you know experience with horses and thought that well maybe it's something similar. <clears throat> the interesting thing is that after the first after Andalus was born, uh, Emmy gave birth to two more young and. For neither of them did she require the hormone replacement therapy. So uh, Ratu will be uh, mated again or uh, to uh, Andalas. And my guess is that they'll try to uh, produce a second calf without the hormone therapy, since it, that, that worked the first time around with her, uh, with his mother. Um, Je rhino gestation is approximately, for all the five species, is approximately 15 to 16 months. Yeah, I mean, the only, the only um, land mammal with a, a longer gestation, I believe, is the elephant, right? Which is 22 months. No, I mean, I, that, see, that, it, it's, that's the kind of information that we, we don't have. It, it's almost impossible to tell. Uh, if you read the literature, it, 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 it frustrates you because you, even with that one population of the Javan rhinos in Ujung Kulon, uh, it, you look at what different people said and who said it's 20 and someone says it's 50 and someone says it's 40 and another 30 within the same time frame without very good evidence. And up to the point that we had those um, camera trap surveys, it was based on indirect evidence, uh, not direct sightings, but the footprints but uh, and the feeding signs and the wallows and the dung and, and things such as that. So you'd see patterns. The, the rhino protection units produce quarterly reports and I, and I review them to see are there any, do we notice any uh, trends? You know, are they s seeing the same number of footprints or crossing of them or uh, dung and, and other? And we saw last year a decline in, for the Sumatran rhino in, um, in one national park that, that seems significant. And I think that's why the estimate, one of the reasons that the estimate has been revised downward right now. But not because you could go out and say, oh, we're missing rhino number 156. Um, and that's why the program in uh, Zimbabwe that I mentioned is, is working so well. And again, it's a species that you, it's a, a, um, a species of the more open habitat, and you can radio collar, and you can tra and, and put transmitters and things such as that. It's intensive management. That's not been possible with either the Sumatran or the Javan rhinos. I mean, there are the researcher in, in that slide uh, that showed the regrowth of the plants, and there was an Indonesian uh, gentleman there. His name is Inov. Um, lots of Indonesians only have a single name, like you know Madonna. So Inov. <laughs> Enov has been, I wouldn't say he's 
study he's not been in the field for ten years but he's been managing that project for or managing studies of the feeding habits of the job in rhino for ten years he's never seen one in the wild he's never seen one i'm in the forest with him i say so when was the last time you saw a job in rhino i've never seen one you're kidding me no i'm looking forward to the day you know we're going to see one we're going to see one because i'm there i'm going back in june with um, with some uh, some of the members of the American Association of Zookeepers, they they do a, an event called Bowling for Rhinos, and it raises money to support uh, Javan and Sumatran rhino conservation. So, uh, as a sort of reward, a way of saying thank you, the two highest um, fundraisers or, or biggest fundraisers keepers across the country, one from National Zoo in Washington and one from Oklahoma City Zoo, are going to go to Indonesia with me in, in June, and we're going to be looking. One of the things we're doing is we're looking for Javan rhinos. I have a plan this time. It's different. <laughs>